Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's webinar. So tonight, Sensible Money's founder and CEO, Dana Anspa, will talk us through how to make plans for taxes in retirement. Dana has long been recognized as one of the nation's leading authorities on retirement planning and decumulation planning. Sensible Money, which she founded in 2011, was last year named one of Inc. 5000's fastest growing privately owned companies in the country. She's the author of Control Your Retirement Destiny, which you can also find as a podcast on Apple, Spotify, and iTunes. And you'll find her popular online course, How to Plan for the Perfect Retirement, available at thegreatcourses.com and at wondrium.com. I'm Nancy Fellinger, one of the financial planners here at Sensible Money, and I'm in Pauley's Island, South Carolina. While most of the team is based in Scottsdale, Arizona, we also have team members in Massachusetts, Florida, Oregon, Indiana, and South Dakota. We work seamlessly with each other and with clients all across the country every day using some of the same technology we're going to be using tonight. And so with that, Dana, let's get started. Well, thank you everyone for taking time on a Thursday evening to join us live. We are going to be talking about taxes in retirement. The last time we did this webinar was about two years ago. It was 2021, and it is our number one watched YouTube video. With uh, last I looked, over 41,000 views. I can't believe that this kind of topic is so popular, so that's pretty exciting. We have updated it, of course, with any tax law changes and some of the brackets change and, and all kinds of stuff that we'll be covering tonight. I'm going to break the webinar into three broad categories. First, I want to talk about the basics. Really, what are some of the tax rules? How do some of the limits apply? What are the relevant things you need to know as you're entering your retirement years? Then I want to talk a bit about the opportunity years. What are those? What are some of the things that, that you want to be aware of as you're entering that time zone between 55 and now about 75? So it's about a 20-year time horizon. And throughout the webinar, we're going to be talking about strategies with specific action steps. What is it you want to look for? What are some tools and resources you can use that are out there on the web? So no time to waste. Let's get started. When I think about the really big picture, in retirement, your cash flow comes from all different kinds of sources. You have Social Security, you have rental income possibly, you might have a pension if you're lucky, you have savings accounts, they could be mutual funds, stocks, bonds, certificates of deposit, I bonds, treasury bills. You likely have savings in an IRA, 401k, or a 403b if you're a teacher perhaps, or a SEP if you're self-employed. And then you might have tax-free savings in a Roth. And so you're going to have a paycheck that comes from what I call this other income source, and then you're going to have a portfolio paycheck. Both sides of these flow into your tax return, but they flow in differently. Once you start Social Security and a pension, it's very consistent, but you have more control over the portfolio paycheck. You can decide when to turn on or off different sources of income that come out of the portfolio paycheck. And so that gives you, I'm not going to say control over your taxes because tax rates are what they are. We don't necessarily have control of them, but there are a lot of ways we can manage our overall tax liability in retirement. And that's what we'll be talking about. When we look at the 2023 tax rates, this is what they look like. So if you're single, the first 11,000 of taxable income is taxed at the 10% rate. If you're married, it's the first 22,000. Now, these brackets are indexed to inflation. So if we look at these brackets just a year ago, this cutoff for singles was 9,950. That's over a 10% indexing factor that was applied. Now, there's a certain formula that indexes these rates every year, um, but it's gone up substantially in the past few years. Now, if you look at the married cutoff, it was 81,050 just a few years ago. I actually can't remember if it was 81,050 last year or if that was actually two years ago. Either way, it's a really large increase in a very short period of time. So these brackets are indexed to inflation. 
And when you cross over a bracket, so if you're married and you have 89,450 of income and the next year you have 90,000 of income, it's only the, the excess that will fall into the next tax rate. So there are still people that believe once you cross over a threshold that all your income is suddenly taxed at that higher rate. No, that's not how it works. Now, there is a different tax schedule that applies to certain types of income qualified dividends and long-term capital gains. So that's what these abbreviations are for. And so if you're single and you had less than $44,625 of, of taxable income, and some of that was qualified dividends and long-term capital gains, it would all be taxed at zero. That range is a bit higher if you're married, and so just as an example, if I had a married couple with $50,000 of, let's say, earned income from work, and then they had additional income from capital gains, well, they could have $38,250 of capital gains and qualified dividends that would actually be taxed at the 0% rate. So there are ways to take advantage of that 0% rate or be aware of it or times where you're ordinary income might be lower and that can be a good year to realize capital gains and take advantage of some preferential tax rates. There's also a hierarchy you want to be aware of. So when you look at ordinary income, the things in the top left of this slide, those are what's going to fall into that first set of tax rates, your pension income withdrawals from traditional IRA and 401k accounts, money that went in pre-tax, up to 85% of your social security, interest from government or corporate bonds, uh, interest income from CDs, certificates of deposit. Now know that interest income from bonds issued by the federal government and its agencies might be exempt from state and local taxes, it usually is, but it is likely to still be taxable at the federal level. Now you have your alternate rate. And alternate rates, we talked about long-term capital gains and qualified dividends. They are subject to that second tax schedule that we looked at. But there's also depreciation recapture. So if you owned rental property and you were able to depreciate that asset over time, when you sell that property, that depreciation gets recaptured on your tax return. And there is a preferential tax rate that applies. I believe the max tax rate is 25%, but it could be 28. And uh, somebody will likely correct me in the chat and let me know if I've got it right or if it, it can be up to 28. I know it's a schedule. So depending on your other income, your depreciation recapture uh, is not a flat rate. It can, it can vary a little bit. But it is lower than the maximum rates at ordinary income. So as an example, if you were a high income earner and your income would normally be taxed at 32 to 37% and you had a rental property, you were able to take advantage of depreciation, later you had to recapture that depreciation, it would be at a lower tax rate than ordinary income. And then you have sources that are not taxed. So assuming they are qualified withdrawals, meaning you've followed all the tax rules, uh, withdrawals from a Roth IRA are typically tax-free, interest from municipal bonds, a portion of your long-term capital gains, as we talked about, if it can fall on the 0% tax rate, and qualified withdrawals from health savings accounts can be tax-free. As many of you know, if you've listened to my webinars before, I love health savings accounts. I only wish we could put more money in them, but you can put the money in tax, for, tax deductible. It grows tax deferred, and assuming it's a qualified withdrawal, you can take it out tax-free later. It's, it's pretty neat. Now, one of the things you have to be aware of in retirement is while you are working, I'm going to go back a few slides, and you have earned income, so that would be like your W-2 income or if you're self-employed, um, you know, you're getting income from your business. And if you're self-employed, you're probably used to making quarterly tax payments. But if you're not self-employed, you get this W-2 and, and your employer withholds all of the taxes for you. Well, what happens when you're retired? 
Well, you would have to tell the pension to withhold taxes or tell Social Security how much taxes you want to have withheld or have taxes withheld from an IRA distribution or if it's capital gains and interest and dividend income that you have, then you will have to make quarterly tax payments. And so this can be new for many retirees. And one of the things that you have to be aware of is how the underpayment penalty works. So if your adjusted gross income was less than 150,000 for last year, let's say for 2022, then in order to avoid any underpayment penalty, you would have to pay either 100% of the tax, federal tax we're talking, that you paid last year, or 90% of the taxes that you end up owing for the current year, for 2023. So let's say this is your first year of retirement. You know, you might not have any tax withholding, but you did while you were working. If you're not aware of this and you didn't do any withholding throughout the year, then when you go to file your 2023 taxes, you could end up with an underpayment penalty simply because you, you weren't aware of these rules. If you make over 150,000, if that was you, your last year's tax return was greater than 150, then the rules are slightly different. You have to pay 110% of the tax that was shown for the previous year or at least 90% of the total taxes for the current year. So how do you know what this 90% is? And what happens, let's say your last year of work, you know, you, you made 280,000. Well, should you actually, and, you, and let's say your tax bill was 38,000. Now you're retired, your income's gonna be a lot less. Should you pay in the 38000 for last year just to avoid the underpayment penalty, or should you pay 90% of what you're expected to, to owe this year? Well, we would say that you would want to do a tax projection and leave yourself some wiggle room and pay the 90%. So you want to have a pretty good estimate of your various sources of income for the first year of retirement so that you didn't overpay by a substantial amount and then end up getting a big refund. Why lend the government money? We can actually earn uh, some interest on our money market and savings accounts now, so we don't want to lend the government the money for, for too long. So this becomes something that's new for a lot of people as they transition into retirement, is this process of estimating their taxes, deciding if they have to make quarterly payments, deciding on where taxes will be withheld. Some uh, sources of cash flow, such as Social Security, will allow you to hold withhold federal taxes. Um, IRAs, you can usually withhold federal taxes. Sometimes you can also withhold state taxes and sometimes you can't. It depends on the state and it also depends on the custodian. For example, we've seen 401k plans that just don't allow state tax withholding. Here in Arizona, we used to be able to do state tax withholding uh, from from IRAs, but the state constitution, they, I can't remember if it was the constitution, but they changed a law or rule that suddenly said, nope, no more tax withholding on uh, IRAs here in Arizona. And there's a, a reason for that. We can get into it in the Q&A if we want to. So what's the takeaway when you're transitioning into retirement? Well, you want to estimate your taxable income. You want to calculate what you think you'll owe for federal and state taxes. You want to set up withholding or quarterly payments. When you do quarterly payments, you can do them online. And typically, your first quarter is made with your tax filing deadline. So April 15th of this year, you would be paying any taxes you still owed from last year. And you could make your first quarterly payment for the 2023 year. The next quarterly payments, June 15th, September 15th, and then this one still says 2023, but it would be January 15th of 2024 is when you would be making a tax payment for uh, still for the 2023 year. Now, something to note is with quarterly payments, while the you look at this underpayment penalty, it's not a huge penalty. Actually, I'm going to go back. I believe it's 3.398 or about 3.4 percent of the underpayment amount so it's not a huge penalty if you should have let's say you under withheld taxes by ten thousand dollars your underpayment penalty would be about 339 but still who wants to to pay an underpayment penalty on top of their taxes nobody and so the thing to know about it is that it it's calculated at year end, but it goes quarter by quarter. 
So let's say you realized in September, oh my gosh, you know, I should have been making quarterly payments all year. And so in September, you make a payment that's enough to cover what you should have paid in April and June. Well, that will help, but you may still have an underpayment penalty since you didn't make those quarter view payments early. And so you can overpay in the first quarter, but you can't necessarily wait and, and overpay in your last quarter. That will not necessarily exempt you from an underpayment penalty. Just something to know. So some free tools. There's an online tool called Dinkytown. Um, this has come up before in our webinar. Dinkytown is a commercial district within a neighborhood in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I believe it's where um, this calculator was developed, but they have a whole set of calculators there. You can go and put all your different sources of income in, and it does a great job of projecting out what your tax liability would be. So even if you're not retired yet, you could go in and say, well, what would happen if I took $50,000 out of my IRA, or if I started my pension, or if I started Social Security and you can play around with that. There's also a calculator that will show you how much of your Social Security will be taxed. So up to 85% of your Social Security can be taxed. It's a formula. It depends on how much other income is coming into your tax return and we'll be looking at a, a real life example of that later on in this webinar. For advisors and planners, there's a tool that we love. It's called Holista Plan. We, it's how we do our tax projections for our clients, and we'll be looking at some screenshots from it that give us some analytics on, on some tax returns uh, here in a few slides. So next, I want to talk about the Retirement Planning Opportunity Zone. These are these years between 50 or 55, and now it could be all the way up to 75. Let's look at everything that's happening during these years. So at 55, let's say you are working and it's past your 55th birthday and you leave your employer and you have a 401k at the, in, the, in that employer's plan. Well, as long as you leave the balance in the plan and you leave that employer after you reached your 55th birthday, you can withdraw funds from that 401k plan penalty tax free. You're still going to pay ordinary income taxes. Normally, you have to wait till 59 and a half. But that's a special rule. And that special rule applies to certain public safety workers as early as age 50. So there are cases where you might leave an employer after you reach 55 where you would want to leave your 401k plan in that employer's plan just to have some liquidity on. If you need to take a withdrawal, you could do it. You wouldn't be subject to the penalty tax. Once you roll that 401k over to an IRA, uh, that rule it, it no longer applies. So it only applies while you leave the funds within the 401k plan. 59 and a half is the age where you can normally withdraw funds from IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, and no penalty tax applies. Income taxes still apply. Now, if you are still working for your employer and you're over 59 and a half, that plan may not allow what are called in-service distributions. So if you're still working, you may not be able to take a distribution from the 401k plan with that employer, even though you're over 59 and a half. 60 is the first age that widow and widowers can become eligible for a Social Security survivor benefits. Um, they will still be subject to something called the earnings limit if they file for Social Security early, uh, but it is the first age where they, they could do that. 62 is the earliest age that you can file for your Social Security benefits on your own earnings record. 63, I put this in here because we're going to talk in a bit about how Medicare Part B and D premiums work, and they look back at your tax return two years prior. So your tax return, the year you turn 63, is what's going to determine your Medicare premiums, Part B and D premiums, when you turn 65. Now, those premiums reset every year. So some people think, what? If I have a lot of income at 63, I'm going to pay these higher premiums um, forever? No. Every year they're looking back at your tax return two years prior to reset your Medicare Part D and, pre and B and D premiums. 
65 is uh, the first age you're eligible for Medicare. That's when you, these, these premiums typically begin. Unless you or your spouse are still working and uh, on an employer plan that has over 20 employees. And in that case, you may be deferring enrollment in part uh, in Medicare or in parts B and D. Your full retirement age, Social Security, that's when you get I'm not going to say it's not the maximum benefits you get, but that's when you can receive Social Security without being subject to the earnings limit. So the earnings limit will take back some of your Social Security benefits if you receive Social Security and continue to work and make in excess of a certain amount. Once you reach your full retirement age, which is determined by your year and month of birth, so once you reach that specified age, then you can collect Social Security and continue to earn as much as you want and and there's no um, holding back of your Social Security benefits for making too much money so that's an important age to know and it's why we often recommend people there's many reasons we often recommend people delay and start Social Security at, at full retirement age or later but that's one of them age 70 is where you get your maximum Social Security benefits there is absolutely no benefit to waiting past age 70 to claim I did talk to someone once who was like six months past age 70 and, you know, hadn't filed for her Social Security benefits yet. And we couldn't like she just hadn't gotten around to it. We're like, you need to go do this right now. You can't get it back. Actually, she was about nine months back. And I believe you can, you know, if you file within six months, they'll, they'll pay back your benefits. But if you waited a whole year, you're going to be out six months of, of benefits that you could have gotten. And then you have required minimum distributions that will begin from your qualified IRA, 401k, 403b, SEPs, or simple accounts. And that's a formula. We'll look at that in a, in a bit. But last year, uh, in December of 2022, with the SECURE Act, they increased the age at which these required distributions start. So it's 73 for um, some of the population. And if you're born 1960 or later, then your required minimum distributions don't begin till 75. So we refer to this now 20, 25 year time span as the opportunity zone because there's so many moving parts and you can strategically decide when to realize capital gains or when to start taking IRA distributions, um, when your social security might begin and all of those things impact your tax return. And by doing it in a more thoughtful way, there are often ways to reduce your total tax liability in retirement. But you have to be aware of all of these moving parts and you have to be aware of when one of these pieces clicks in place, how is that going to change and how is that going to impact the taxes that you're going to owe the next year. Now, there are all different components of the tax code and to make it even more confusing, a lot of those components refer to something called MAGI, Modified Adjusted Gross Income. But there's all different formulas, and they all use the same acronym, MAGI, Modified Adjusted Gross Income. Well, there's one formula to determine if you're eligible to make Roth IRA contributions. It's your adjusted gross income, which you find on your tax return, less traditional IRA contributions, less any Roth conversion amounts that were included in your AGI. There's a different formula to determine if you can make a deductible IRA contribution. It's your AGI, less traditional IRA contributions. There's a formula to determine if you are eligible for the health care tax credit. This tax credit can apply if you retired, you're not yet on Medicare, you're not yet 65, and your income is low enough, then you may be eligible for a credit that helps you pay for your health insurance. That formula is AGI plus non-taxable Social Security plus untaxed foreign income plus tax-exempt interest. And there's a, another formula that is used in the MAGI calculation to determine the amount of Medicare Part B and D premiums, and that's your adjusted gross income plus tax exempt interest. Huh, oh, it's a lot, isn't it? This is why we use software and plug all the numbers in, and it tells us which of these applicable limits are actually going to apply. 
So one of the things that you should be aware of is the health care tax credit. And it applies to a lot of people that you wouldn't think would be eligible for such a tax credit. So I'm going to walk through an example in a minute of a, a household that has a, a portfolio over $2 million. They retired before the age of 60, and they are able to qualify for this health care tax credit. And it's a substantial credit that's helping them pay for their health insurance. The way the formula works is let's say you are a household of two. These are the federal poverty gui guidelines. So these guidelines will apply to the 2023 year. Let's say you're retired and you're age 62. If we can keep your income around 54,000 a year or under this limit, we can go down here to this 300% of the federal poverty level limit and this tells us that the maximum amount that you would be expected to contribute toward your health care premiums would be 6% of your income. And so when you look at this, you go, okay, well, if you could keep your income even lower down here, the maximum amount you would be expected to pay could be zero. So almost all of your health care costs could be covered. Now, the way that this formula works is it's, it's um, you know, they're measuring against, I believe it's the second lowest cost silver plan on the healthcare.gov website. And so they're using that as a benchmark premium. And then they're saying, all right, if you qualified at this level, the maximum amount you would have to pay would be 6% of that benchmark premium. And the Government will take the difference between that 6% of the benchmark and then credit you, give you a credit for the difference. So we're going to look at an actual tax return here in a bit, how this was applied and the amount of credit that that household got. What we've seen happen is sometimes people aren't aware of this um, or they think their income is going to be low and then they take an IRA distribution and suddenly that bumps their income up over this limit and they don't get the credit or if they applied for the credit in advance now they have to pay it back and so there are different ways like let's say you had a cd maturing well that cd when the principal matures that's not extra taxable income on your tax return only the interest income it earned is reported and so you could use that cd for your living expenses and not take an ira withdrawal so that's just one very simple example of how you might decide if you're retired where is my cash flow going to come from and how do i strategically decide where it's going to come from like putting a puzzle together so that I can qualify for, for some of these things if, if they're applicable to me. Next, we have the Medicare Part B and D premiums. And this is also determined by your adjusted gross income. This one you have to add back any tax-free interest. And so it, it, these are the 2023 premiums shown. I have a typo in here. It's not 2,310. There's an extra zero on there. Um, but if you were a single and your adjusted gross income was over 97,000, instead of paying a baseline premium of 165, you would end up paying 231. If you were married and you fell in this third tier, your adjusted gross income, instead of paying 165 each, you would pay 330 each. And then there's also a smaller means testing that applies to Part D. The technical term for this is called IRMA, the Income Related Monthly Adjustment Amount. And it does reset every year. So if you cross over one of these thresholds, it's not permanent. If you retired and your income is much lower now, that's one of seven reasons that you can request a reconsideration. So you can file and you have to file a form. I believe it's within 90 days of receiving your ARMA premium notice. And you can say, hey, you know, I really shouldn't have to pay this, this higher amount because I'm retired now and my income will not be exceeding these thresholds. However, if your income exceeded those thresholds because of a Roth conversion or because you sold a property and you had a lot of capital gains, well, that is not a reason for reconsideration. 
doesn't mean you shouldn't do a Roth conversion. We've done that analysis many, many times, and in most cases, it still makes sense to do the Roth conversion. It's just something to be aware of. You have to know that if I do this, have I also factored in the impact that that may put me into a higher Part B threshold for a year or two? Another piece that you want to be aware of are is the required minimum distribution formula. And so here is an example of how it works. So for every $100,000 balance that you have, when you reach 73, you take your year-end balance divided by the applicable advisor that applies to your age. So 100,000 divided by 26.5, you would be required to take out 3,774 for each $100,000 that you have. As you get older, that divisor goes down and the amount that you're required to take out goes up. And so that will naturally create more and more taxes as you get older. Yes, you have to take more out, but a larger piece of that may have to be withheld and go right to the IRS. This is one of the reasons that Roth IRA conversions during those opportunity years can be beneficial. Sometimes you are able to move money from a traditional IRA. You take it out, it shows up, and it's taxable income on your tax return that year. From that point forward, it's in the Roth IRA, and there won't be these required minimum distributions. And because you took a portion of that balance out, less of that IRA balance is growing and accumulating you know, investment gains. And so your future required minimum distributions are lower and it can often have the impact of lowering the total taxes you pay over your retirement years. Yes, you had to pay taxes up front when you did the conversion, but when you look at it over your lifetime, it may have substantially lowered your tax liability. There's usually a break even calculation that you wanna look at. It can be as short as seven years, meaning Wow, as long as I've, I've lived seven years past this Roth conversion, it worked to my benefit. Sometimes it can be a, a longer uh, break even, 12 or 15 years. That may still make sense if you will never spend all of your wealth and a lot of it is going to be passed on to future generations, then you are simply saying, yes, you know, 12 or 15 year break even is fine. I will be prepaying the taxes uh, for, for many of my heirs. So looking at all of this, what do you do? Well, you really want to project your adjusted gross income and your tax rate throughout those opportunity years. So right now, it's about from the first year of retirement through about the end of the year that you reach ages 74 or 76, depending on, on your required minimum distributions. So you want to have a map of where you expect your, your AGI and your taxable income to be, and that map helps show you where there might be opportunities, years where your tax rate's lower, years where you could realize capital gains at a lower tax rate. Next, if you are retiring pre-65, you want to see if you could be eligible for the health care tax credit. Even if you have a large portfolio, sometimes there are ways to get the cash flow you need from that portfolio without having a big tax impact attached to it. So don't disqualify yourself and say, oh, you know, I have so much saved, there's no way I would ever be eligible for that. Sometimes you still are. And of course, you want to identify years, as I said, where your, your tax rate may be lower and, uh, and flag those years as potential opportunities for Roth conversions or, as I mentioned, for realizing capital gains. So next, I, I want to look at different strategies that you can apply. We are huge fans that smart planning helps get you more retirement income. Uh, occasionally we get asked about why we have oranges on our website and our branding. And uh, the story is it came from me having breakfast at this restaurant called Butterfields. And there were these oranges rolling down this contraption. And I had been making homemade margaritas the weekend before and hand squeezing these oranges. And there's always extra juice left over in the rind. And it was really messy. And, and I'd look at the rind and I'd think, man, like there's all this extra juice I'm not getting. Well, I was watching those oranges go through this machine and I thought, wow, I bet this professional machine gets more juice out of every orange than I could possibly get doing it myself at home. And so that is how our branding came about is, is I had this 
aha moment of that's exactly what we do for clients. We don't believe we have some magic way to pick the right stocks or the right investments or market time things. We don't think anyone can do that successfully, but we do think with smart tax planning, with using the tax rules, that you can add real value to clients. You can save sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes. And so that's what we mean when we talk about smart planning. We're gonna talk about some of those strategies right now. I like to group it into three main buckets. So bucket one is how you manage your investments. Now, if everything you have is in an IRA, that bucket is not gonna be so applicable to you. But if you have an IRA and a Roth IRA, what we call asset location would say, well, it may make sense to put certain types of assets in your Roth IRA and other types of assets in your traditional IRA. And over time, that can be a tax strategy. There are things called gain loss harvesting. I'll show you an example of that. And then there's the actual fund choices. So if you have money in non-IRA, taxable brokerage accounts, mutual funds, stocks, bonds, uh, mutual funds in particular, Certain types of funds are not very tax efficient. They have large capital gains distributions each year. Other types of funds like index funds are quite tax efficient. And so the actual fund choices that you make within a taxable account can lead to a different impact on your tax return. Bucket number two is how you fund accounts. So there's a, a life cycle we go through and when you are in your peak earning years, it probably makes sense to use your deductible 401k options. But sometimes at the front end of your career, sometimes if you went through a period of unemployment or at the tail end of your career, you may scale down to part-time work. It can make sense to fund Roth 401ks or Roth IRAs. Now, with a Roth 401k, a lot of people still don't know, there is not an income cap. So there is an income cap to put money into a Roth IRA through a contribution. There is not an income cap to do a Roth conversion, where I'm moving from an IRA to a Roth, and there is not an income cap to put money in a Roth 401k. So most employers now will have to offer Roth 401ks, and so they're, they're often called designated Roth accounts, and you can ask your employer if you do, and usually that gives you a way uh, to contribute to the tax-free Roth, even if you make too much to do it in an IRA. So how you fund and how you withdraw tax efficiently is bucket number two. And number three is what I call using the extras. So while 85% of your social security may be taxed, I like to look at the bright side, 15% will be tax free. And so how do you maximize that? How do you pay attention to your part B and D thresholds? Should you use Roth conversions, qualify for the tax credits, use something called qualified charitable distributions? So once you reach the age of 70, you can distribute money right from an IRA direct to charity and that distribution doesn't show up on your adjusted gross income. The reason that becomes important is when you looked at some of those other components of the tax code and how many formulas use adjusted gross income, well, it reduces your income for all of those other applicable formulas also. So there's all kinds of extras that, that you can take advantage of. So we're gonna talk about just a few of these. One, when we talk about gain loss harvesting, what is that? Well, this is an example of a Vanguard fund, S&P 500 fund, symbol VFIAX, has an expense ratio of only 0.04%, and a Schwab S&P 500 index fund, symbol SWPPX, has an expense ratio of only 0.02%. And you can see that they're tracking pretty much dollar for dollar. They own the same stocks in the same proportions. And so we should see that these two funds are, are going to perform pretty much identically. And so when you look at this, if you were to exchange during one of these market downturns, one fund for another, let's say you had bought the fund up here in, November of 2022, and this was May of 2023, and you said, wow, I bought this fund in a taxable account, but now it's down in value. I will exchange it for an, a similar index fund, 
and I will capture the tax loss that I can use on my tax return, but although I realized an investment loss on paper, the new investment I own is very similar, and so as the fund recovers, my investment will recover. Now, you can't buy the exact same security, so there's something called a wash sale rule that you have to watch out for, but in this case, uh, it's a very similar security, and so you would be able to use this particular tax loss strategy. Now, where does that show up on your tax return? Well, this is an example when, and this is a 2021 tax return screenshot, where you can see this line item, this is on a Schedule D, Part 2, where there's a capital loss carryover. And so probably in 2020, when we had the market downturn with COVID, we did quite a bit of tax loss harvesting for different clients. And so we would have realized a tax loss and now that's going to carry forward for this client. And first, it's gonna offset, we see this line 13, capital gain distributions. Well, if you own mutual funds in a taxable account, some of those mutual funds will have distributions because they bought and sold stocks throughout the year. Even though you didn't make a single transaction, you could have, in this case, $5,854 of capital gains flowing through to your tax return. So that's what we call an embedded gain distribution or a you know a capital gain distribution from a mutual fund that wasn't because you actually bought or sold something. But that capital loss carryover will offset it. And so um, at the end of 2021, there will still be you know 9,346 that can carry forward actually even a little bit less because once it offsets any gains, 3,000 of this loss can then offset ordinary income. And so realizing uh, capital losses, in, not just to sit in cash, but actually doing an exchange so you will participate in any recovery uh, of the investment markets can be beneficial over the long term to your tax return. Next, there's what we call asset location. And here's how we see a lot of accounts allocated is you might have a household that has a million dollars and it has about 30, 40 percent, we'll say in bonds, and I'm just using a very simple allocation model, about 30 percent in large cap mutual funds, and we'll say 30 percent in emerging markets. And we'll see each account allocated the same. So let's say this is an IRA and a non-IRA. And we'll see this with Roth IRAs a lot. They will be balanced, 60% stocks, 40% bonds in each different account type. Well, there is a better way to do it. And so a more tax efficient allocation might say, well, I'm going to have my bonds inside my IRA and my large cap stocks uh, inside my IRA. And over here in my non-IRA, or let's say this was a Roth, I'm going to have um, very few bonds, but I'm going to have all my investments that could generate qualified dividends and long-term capital gains taxed at a more preferential tax rate. You don't get to take advantage of that preferential tax rate when they're tucked inside of an IRA. And so same if we had a Roth IRA in here and we look at when we will tap those different accounts for retirement income, well, the Roth IRA is last. Usually you're not going to touch it till, you know, maybe ever, certainly not till later in life. You want it to grow tax-free as long as possible. So oftentimes in early retirement, there would be no reason at all to have bonds uh, in the Roth IRA. You would want all of the investments that had the potential for the highest returns to be in the Roth IRA. So that concept is what we call asset location. Now, one of the things to be aware of is the accounts that you will need to take money from. We always think that um, cash flow needs will trump asset location. So here I have the bonds in the IRA, but suppose that what you're really going to need is to take withdrawals from a taxable trust account. Well, you are going to want to have enough safe investments in that trust account to support the amount of withdrawals that you're going to need in your first few years. So cash flow would be applied first. Once you have your cash flow laid out, then you would say, is there a way to apply asset location to make my investment structure a little more tax efficient? 
When you look at tax efficiency, this list goes from most to least tax efficient. So when you own these types of investments in non-tax deferred accounts, there's what are called tax managed funds, and they are designed to have none of those embedded gain distributions. Exchange traded funds are also usually quite tax efficient. Index funds, then large cap. Small cap stock funds typically have a little more turnover. That makes them a little less tax efficient. International can have more turnover. And um, when you're looking at non-tax deferred accounts, this is where you might own municipal bonds. So I've had people ask me, for example, they only have an IRA and they'll say, well, shouldn't I own municipal bonds? I heard they're tax-free. And, and municipal bonds do generate tax-free interest income, but inside your IRA, that doesn't matter. Every dollar that comes out of the IRA will be taxable income on your tax return. Things that are less tax efficient, real estate funds, commodities, corporate or government bond funds, high yield bond funds. And so when you're in the accumulation mode, uh, it may make more sense to put some of those investments inside your tax deferred accounts. As you get closer to retirement, again, you wanna look at the specific cash flows that you'll need and align your allocation up to that. So lots of different rules. I see lots of questions coming in. We will um, get to those in a minute. And if Nancy sees anything that's really relevant to one of the slides that we're looking at, she, she will interrupt me. But I want to transition into looking at some actual tax returns. So we just went through a ton of rules. How does it actually apply in real life? Like, what does it look like? So let's take a look. This is what I will call tax return A. It is a married filing jointly return, ages 68 and 66 in 2023, retired several years ago. One of this couple will begin Social Security this year, and their monthly cash flow after income taxes is about 10,750. So after all federal taxes, they have about 10,750 a month to spend. They have about 1.8 million in our portfolios, and these are listed in the hierarchy of the most of their money is in IRAs. They have a much smaller amount in trusts, Roth IRAs, and a, and a jointly titled account. They take a portfolio withdrawal that's 6,500 a month or 78,000 a year, and the rest of their income comes from pensions, I believe, and then you'll also see some rental income here. Their strategies, they are delaying Social Security while they are withdrawing from IRAs, and some years we have done some small Roth conversions. We're gonna look at their 2021 return on the right and their 2022 return here on the left. So in 2021, their total income was 151,000. We can see there was taxable IRA distributions in both years, there was dividend income, there was a small amount of wages. One person works part-time at a, at a fun job. There was a taxable pension, small amount of taxable pension. And the big difference was capital gains. Now, in both years, their marginal tax rate is 12%. So what's going on? We might say, well, how could they have so much more income in 2021 and that they are still only in the 12% marginal rate? Well, here we're going to look at two other things. First, their itemized deductions. And so we can see that in 2021, they had 15,000, but they didn't get to itemize because the standard deduction was greater. And the same thing happened in 2022. Now, this is a great example of the impact that that change to the larger standard deduction has ha had. They may still be able to itemize for state, but for federal returns, lots of people simply aren't able to itemize deductions. Now we have their total tax. They paid almost 12,000 in 2021 and about 7,600 in 2022. So again, you know, but it said they were only in the 12% tax rate. So what's going on? Well, this is the excerpt from Holista Plan. And here we can see in 2021, these are their ordinary income tax rates. So 
their sources of income that qualified as ordinary income, they had 50,367. Their total income, however, was 123. And what happened is that made their capital gains flow 30,000 into the 0% tax rate and 42,000 of their capital gains in the 15%. This was capital gains, it's all qualified incomes. You see the total here, 72,685. Well, in 2022, they had more income that fell into this ordinary income. They had a higher IRA distribution, so that would have fallen in this category. And now we can see they didn't have nearly the amount of capital gains, uh, but it all fell in the 0% tax rate. So this is a good example of how that flows through to a tax return and some of the differences that you see in this ordinary income tax rate versus the capital gain tax rate. And I think this shows a great illustration of even though their total income went over that threshold of the 0% tax rate, they still had some of their capital gain income that qualified for the 0% rate because it was really the difference between this ordinary income and that first threshold amount that was about 89,000. Well, it'll be 89,000 in 2023. It was a little lower in 2021. The other thing to think about if we go back a slide is these itemized deductions. Now, they have a small amount of charitable contributions, but some people will start to bundle their itemized deductions, meaning let's say there's a certain amount you like to contribute to charity every year. Well, you might bundle it and use something called a donor advised fund where you make a really large contribution one year, let's say $30,000. And so you get the deduction on your tax return and that helps you qualify for using all your itemized deductions if it exceeds the standard deduction. And then within that donor advised fund, you might dole out that money 2,000 uh, per year or 5,000 per year to the various charitable organizations that you wanted to donate to. So there are ways to, you know, in some cases, bundle your itemized deductions to, to help qualify. Now, the other thing for this taxpayer is they are not crossing any of the Medicare Part B and D IRMA thresholds. So we don't have to worry about that. Um, we're, you know, we're just really looking at how does their income flow through between these ordinary income rates and these capital gain tax and qualified dividend rates. Now, let's look at taxpayer B. They are ages 81 and 69 in 23. They've been retired for over a decade. Their monthly cash flow after income taxes is 13,000. They have about a $7.4 million portfolio size. Almost all of it is in a trust. There's a small amount in Roths. I don't know if there's any. There might be a small amount left in an IRA. Uh, they take 11,000 a month from their portfolio and then extras for if a car purchase is needed or, or things like that. Strategies are to manage their portfolio to reduce the tax impact while keeping it risk level appropriate. This is a screenshot from their 2020 tax return. So their total income was 255. A significant portion of that was dividend income, which as we know, most of that, well, a lot of it was qualified dividends. They had taxable IRA distributions. That was actually, probably, well, I'm gonna guess it was a Roth conversion. Small amount of taxable pension, a small amount of taxable social security, and then capital gains of 36,000. Their marginal tax rate in 2020 was 22%. But here we go to 2021, their total income was almost, well, double, more than double, but their marginal tax rate was only 12%. So again, here we see how looking at a marginal rate won't give you the whole picture. Their dividend income was much higher, pension, social security, about the same, but it was really this capital gain. And this is what I mean about managing a portfolio to reduce the tax impact 
there was a, a significant surge in the markets after coming out of 2020. And those are times where you want to sell some of those gains. And there's a saying called, don't let the tax tail wag the dog. And so that's one of those cases where, you know what, there's been this significant increase in, in a lot of the investment holdings. We need to sell and take some of those gains and put it in something safer. And in order to do that, we're going to have to realize some capital gains. And so that's what you're seeing here. Now, when you look at their itemized deductions, last year they were able to itemize primarily due to medical and dental expenses. This year uh, they were not able to itemize. So their standard deduction was greater this year than the itemized. And then we look at the various taxes. Here's their tax before credits. They did get a, a tax for credit for foreign taxes that were paid. Here was their tax after credits, and whoa, what's this other taxes? Well, this is something called the net investment income tax that impacts higher taxpayers, usually households with uh, modified adjusted gross incomes over 250,000 if married, I believe it's over 200,000 if single. And so because they had this much larger capital gain, they became subject to this net investment income tax. It's 3.8% of either what's called your net investment income or 3.8% of the amount of your modified adjusted gross income that exceeds your threshold. It's, it's the lower of those two. So this could be a surprise if we weren't prepared for it. And you would say, oh my gosh, I went from owing $26,000 in taxes to $83,000 in taxes. And so as you're managing a portfolio for risk, there are times where your tax bill could go up substantially. Now, when we look at their analytics, so this is again from Holista Plan, then here we have their marginal tax bracket information. And in 2020, they only had 83,000 uh, that fell in this ordinary income. So that put them in the 22% tax rate. Most of their capital gains fell in this 15%. Actually, all of their capital gains and qualified dividends fell in this 15% tax rate. Now I added their Medicare Part B and D premiums. So in 2020, that will determine the premium threshold used for their 2022 year. And they were in this middle tier. And so they would each be expected to pay about 238 a month for their Part B premiums. Now in 2021, we had the much larger capital gains. So their ordinary income was lower. It, you know, it, it all fell and kept them under the 12%. Because of that, even though they had larger capital gains, some of it was taxed at zero. Some of it was taxed at 15%, and some of their capital gains crossed over into the 20% threshold amount. Because they had this extra income, it moved them up one Medicare Part B and D premium. So in 2023, they will have to pay uh, one set higher Medicare Part B and D premiums. Now, they could have avoided that. We could have said, oh, we're not going to realize so much capital gains. But from a risk standpoint, uh, that wouldn't have necessarily been smart. Sometimes in order to make your portfolio a little less risky, you have to realize capital gains. Then we have taxpayer C. And with taxpayer C, they were age 63 and 62. They retired several years ago. They have $11,500 a month of after-tax income, a portfolio size of $2.8 million, most of it in a trust, and then some Roth IRAs and traditional IRAs, and they take all of their income right now from the portfolio. Their primary strategy is to maintain eligibility for the health care tax credit. So here we have someone with $2.8 million, $11,500 a month of cash flow, and what was reported on their 21 tax return was 24,000 of total income, and in 2022, 22,000. How can this be? Well, when you buy bonds and ladder out those bonds, let's say we have a you know $130,000 bond that matured at the beginning of this year, or a set of bonds to cover this cash flow. Well, when that bond matures, that's not a taxable event. 
the interest income that the bond produced and in it is also a lot of tax-free interest from municipal bonds. Um, the interest income is reported on your tax return as you go along, but when the principal, uh, you know, pays back, that's not a taxable event. And so you can structure a portfolio to deliver this kind of cash flow and yet have very low taxes. Now that can't last forever. At some point we have to sell some of the stocks and buy more bonds, but it can be structured that way initially so their taxable income can stay quite low during these years. So when we look at their, well, we saw their marginal tax rate zero. Then we look at their, um, Itemized deductions last year, nope, they didn't qualify. Um, and I think we're 21 and 22. Yeah, 2022, they did qualify again primarily because of medical and dental expenses, but they actually had negative taxable income in 2022. Now, normally we would look at that and think, oh my gosh, this is a horrible missed opportunity. I could have converted money from an IRA to a Roth IRA and paid no tax. I could have converted $12,000 and at least gotten to zero taxable income. But because of the healthcare tax credit, it was not a missed opportunity. Even though this total income line is what most, um, in their case, would, would be equivalent to adjusted gross income, when you look at the tax credit formula, this is the tax form where you fill it out for to get your premium tax credit, it's modified adjusted gross income. Well, how did that get to 41704 from that $22,000 number? Well, it's because they have tax-exempt interest. In their portfolio, there's a lot of municipal bonds, so we add that $19,040 to this $22,664, and that's how we get to this $41,000 of modified adjusted gross income. Now, here's the formula. That puts them at 239% of the federal poverty line, and so their applicable contribution to their healthcare premium is basically three and a half percent or 1485 a year 124 a month well what they're actually paying for their health insurance is 21,000 the benchmark premium that's used by the government is 17,796 and so you take 0.0356 percent of the 17,796 and based on their income that's the part they have to pay and so they get a credit for 16,311. And so that's basically free money that's coming because of this credit. And when we run this analysis out, even though it looks like we could have done a Roth conversion and paid no tax on it, if we had done that, they would have lost a substantial portion of this credit. And when we look at this analysis, we think this credit um, is worth more over time. It's actually free money that you're getting back versus the Roth conversion. Well, in this case, they still would have paid zero, but you can't, you know, they would have actually had to pay out money to cover this premium if they didn't get the credit. So this is one of those cases, and it's not the only one. We have several of these where people who have pretty substantial portfolios are able to qualify for this premium tax credit. And the last one we're going to look at, and then we will open it up for Q&A, is a single. So single, age 76 in 2023, retired over a decade. Monthly cash flow, 5,300 after taxes. Portfolio size, 900,000, most of it in an IRA. Only taking $1,000 a month from the portfolio. Now, the strategies are to do tax loss harvesting on anything in the trust and try to keep her taxable portfolio income low. In 2020, you can see there's a pension coming in. Now, what happens here? This person's 76, why would their taxable Social Security jump from 2,000 to 26,000? We can see they have a capital loss carryover from doing some tax loss harvesting. Well, what happened is in 2020, the required minimum distribution was waived. Didn't have to take them for 2020. And they had enough money to live on and didn't need that IRA distribution. And in 2021, 
the required distributions picked back up. And so what happens is the different tax formulas all interact. And so when this extra income showed up on the tax return, the formula then made more of the Social Security taxable. And so what you end up with is the difference between a 10% marginal rate and a 22% marginal rate. And that change was simply due to no RMD and then having the RMD. Now, in this case, it was because the RMD was waived in 2020. But for a lot of you, when you reach your RMD age, whether that's age 73 or 75, this is something to be aware of. You could see this jump in your tax bill and think, oh my gosh, what happened? Like, you know, why do I have an underpayment penalty now? I don't have enough cash to cover this extra tax bill. Well, it's something that you want to plan ahead for. You want to understand that when that IRA distribution begins, it may make a lot more of your Social Security taxable. How much more? Well, in this case, we went from $14 of tax to $8,000 of tax. It was essentially a 28% tax rate on that, that this extra $29,000 of income cost. So if you just take that tax divided by this income, you know, it was like, wow, a marginal rate of 28% applied because of this, this IRA distribution. Now, an $8,000 tax bill is pretty big for someone that has $5,300 a month of income. And so if you hadn't planned ahead for that, it definitely could, could catch you off guard. Now, one last thing I, I wanna cover, I see a comment came in call, calling it the tax torpedo. Yes, this is what is referred to as the tax torpedo. And it definitely can impact people with, you know, a mid range of income, let's say zero to $90,000 of income. Last thing I wanna cover is just some tax mistakes to avoid. There's a video we have online. Um, we can hopefully, if we remember, send it out when we send out the recording that covers these 1099 mistakes. But these are ones that we come across all the time. First, while you were working, if you made non-deductible IRA contributions, you have to track the cost basis. Now, every dollar that you take out of your IRA will not all of it will be taxed because some of it went in as a non-deductible contribution. And you're supposed to track that on a tax form 8606. But what happens? Sometimes you change ta tax preparers and that 8606, the numbers don't carry forward. Sometimes you forget to tell your tax preparer or if it's yourself, you forget to put it on there. You don't know you're supposed to file an 8606. So I had somebody once who was in the accounting profession. Now we knew that they had put in actually several hundred thousand dollars of non-deductible contributions because they had maxed out non-deductible IRA contributions for himself and his wife every year for over a decade and probably about 20 years they had done it and when they went to withdraw it was this oh my gosh we don't have our basis we never filed an 8606 so we were able to go back and, and backtrack it for them but the initial reaction was, oh, I'm not going to worry about it. They said, oh, and I was like, no, you will be double taxed on that money. Like, this is important. You have to track down the cost basis. Um, next, 1099 R's is what you get when you take a distribution from some type of retirement account. Well, they are going to report the gross amount of the distribution. We have many clients who use this qualified charitable distribution, but you have to track that and let your CPA, or if it's yourself, you know, you have to say, hey, my gross distribution was 15,000, but I put a thousand of that direct to charity, so the taxable portion of my IRA distribution was only 14. Again, qualified charitable distributions only apply if you're age 70 or older. Sometimes we see people incorrectly report their rollovers as taxable. So you might roll over a 401k to an IRA or transfer one IRA from one custodian to another. Well, that's not a taxable event, but the 1099R comes out and sometimes it can simply get misreported. And we have seen people not even report their 1099R income, their first year of retirement. They took an IRA withdrawal. They just weren't paying attention. Oh, I didn't know we had to do something with that tax form. Um, 
we've seen 1099 R's from pensions get missed. Again, you know, somebody changed tax preparers or maybe they moved, they forgot to update their address, they have a direct deposit from that pension so they never thought about it, but the tax form gets mailed and they don't get it and so suddenly uh, that income doesn't get reported. And when you do Roth conversions, if you have these non-deductible IRA contributions, then only it's, it's a pro rata tax calculation, and that applies to your Roth conversions also. So tracking that non-deductible basis is important. Last set of takeaways, and we are going to open it up for Q&A. What should you do? Well, locate assets in a way that helps you reduce your taxable reportable income. Use gain-loss harvesting in your non-qualified brokerage accounts. So we think it makes sense to realize losses when that loss can get used against ordinary income. You can realize losses to offset gains that fall into a higher capital gains rate. But if you're going to be in the 0% capital gains tax rate anyway, then there's no reason to do tax loss harvesting. And you can bank losses to lower future years adjusted gross income. You can use Roth conversions or IRA withdrawals during some of your low tax rate years. Um, if you're retired pre-age 65, we tell you to be careful. So only do this if you know you will not qualify for the health care tax credit. And you want to make a draft plan. So you want to have this all laid out. Which years should you withdraw from? And are there some things that you can do that can help lower your tax liability? People always ask what types of programs might project this. There's a few. Um, ES Planner by Larry Kutlikoff does the taxes correctly. Uh, New Retirement has a great community and online tax calculator. You have to put all the data in, but I think they do a great job with their tax calculations. And Wealth Trace is another one that we've seen that we think does a, a good job in terms of the taxes. So if you're a do-it-yourselfer, um, those are some options you can use. We, of course, always encourage people to talk to a financial advisor, but we know that's not for everybody. Um, we do offer complimentary conversations, and you can go to our website and fill out a questionnaire, and we will respond and, and get an appointment set up. So all of that being said, I am going to open it up to Q&A as we normally do. And as you know, we encourage questions. And I won't say we'll stay for hours. The last webinar we did, we had over an hour of Q&A. But we're sure going to try. And if we can't get your question answered here, um, Nancy is going to come back on camera. And she will often follow up with you afterwards to, to make sure that we get your question answered. All right. Thank you. So lots of questions, Dana. Um, let me start at the at the top. What do you think about whether or not to pay off your mortgage going into or during early retirement, say 56? Interest rate is 2.625. Uh, 2 oh, what a, what a nice rate on a 30-year mortgage. $450,000 balance. Thanks. So... I always have to qualify. Oh, and I forgot my disclosure in this in the slide. So my disclosures before I do q and A, I'll have to try to remember them. But um, we always like to let you guys know any examples we look at are just that. They're just examples. Uh, nothing in this webinar is a solicitation for securities or a recommendation to buy or sell specific investments. And there are no guarantees. You always need to do your own research. OK, I've got my disclosures out of the way. That being said, my gut reaction is if I had a mortgage rate under 3%, I would not pay it off. Right now on short-term CDs, you can earn 5%. Um, you can lock in even longer-term yields on agencies and treasury bills at 4%. And so, you know, my gut tendency would be to say, well, if interest rates go up even a little bit more, you know, why would I pay off a mortgage at less than 3%? Now, that being said, I don't know anything about your personal situation. And so I tell people I can run the numbers and look at the logic and the math and give you the Dr. Spock answer. I grew up watching Star Trek, right? The logic. And yet that's not the only factor that we should think about. So there's the, the math answer, which I would say if you have a mortgage rate under 5%, I I would probably not pay it off. And then there's the, is it really going to make that much difference? Like, if you just 
feel better having that mortgage paid off, well, that's worth something. And, and so, you know, that's, that's a consideration. It also depends on where the money comes from. Like if you had to take a big IRA distribution to pay off the mortgage, that's probably not going to work because that IRA distribution is going to be taxable. But if you had an inheritance that came in and you said, oh, I could use that, that may be a different answer. And I've even had a situation where we ran the numbers and because of that tax torpedo that we looked at with Social Security, it actually did make sense to take an IRA distribution and pay off a mortgage. But the balance was much smaller. It was a, about $110,000, $120,000 balance. So gut would be, no, I probably wouldn't pay it off, but now I've given you all of the other, it depends <laughs> situations where um, it's, it's really hard to know without knowing your whole situation. Uh, as a general rule, do you think someone who has retired early and has a good financial plan that will leave a good legacy should also have life insurance or is the portfolio the life insurance policy for survivors? As a general rule, we would say no. You know, the goal is life insurance is supposed to cover your earnings and the people that are dependent on you. And so once you're retired, do you still need that? Like if you and your spouse are going to be fine, no matter what happens to either of you, then, you know, as a general rule, no. Now, that being said, sometimes people own existing policies, uh, whole life policies, where once they've been in it long enough, we look at it and we go, well, if I evaluate it from an investment standpoint at this point, it may not make sense to necessarily cancel it or cash it in. So you have to do that analysis uh, on its own. But would I necessarily buy new insurance or you know, look at that? Probably not. Now, if someone was exceeding the estate tax threshold, now there becomes other reasons to own life insurance, right? It can be a way to guarantee a tax-free amount that goes to your heirs. Some people leaving money to their heirs is very important, and so they want to, you know, feel comfortable spending the rest, and if they had that life insurance, they they feel more comfortable. Okay, I could spend this, this, and this, and I still know this amount is going to go directly to my heirs. This is why it's personal finance. It's so personal to our own situation and our values. Yep. Um, is there a ballpark dollar value to hold in a Roth account during retirement years? Let's say a couple has 30, uh, 35,000 from various income sources plus social security of 30,000 for one person or a combined um, social security of $55,000. So, with I guess the question really is with that income, you know, does it make sense to hold Roths and how much? Well, it's hard for me to understand like hold Roths, like you were able, either able to fund Roth IRAs along the way and so you already have money in Roths. And so then the question becomes when do I tap that Roth IRA? When do I withdraw mm -hmm. it? Or the question is, should I convert some of my IRA to a Roth? So I'm not, not quite sure what the question is. There really isn't a benchmark amount because it's really about how you were able to get money into that Roth along the way. And now once you're retired, if you already have that money in the Roth, um, it's, it's just a whole different analysis. We'd be either looking at, should you be doing Roth IRA conversions? And I don't know without doing a, a tax projection. And then if you already have money in a Roth IRA, when should you tap it? And usually we're letting the Roth IRA grow to be touched later in life. Sometimes there's a strategy where the Roth might support some lumpy purchases, like you need a new automobile every five years. And if you only have you know traditional IRA assets and you take it out, it'll all be taxed. So maybe every five years, you know you're going to pull so much out of the Roth IRA to help support some of those lumpy or big ticket items. If a spouse who has not worked outside of the home wants to take Social Security at 62, how is the benefit amount calculated based on the spouse's income who continues to work? So if you file at 62, you're going to be filing if the spouse that's continuing to work hasn't filed yet and you file at 62, you're going to be filing on your own earnings record. You're not going to be eligible for a spousal benefit yet. 
And so it's going to be what's called your full retirement age, your primary insurance amount, and then you're going to take a pretty big haircut. You're going to have to have that be discounted substantially for claiming early. Now, you can claim early and get then your own 62 much reduced benefit amount. And then when the working spouse eventually retires, you will then become eligible for a spousal benefit. And that would be up to 50% of their full retirement age benefit amount. And so then you would likely get a little bit of extra on top of the amount that you are getting. I, it, nobody's going to understand that. I have this great, um, I wonder if I can get there. I have this, if you go to our website and you go to the resource, learn tab and there's a resources page, I have this PDF download on how your social security benefits are calculated. And that may be um, kind of useful. And as you're asking the next question, Nancy, if I can find it, I'll see if I can can pull it up on my other screen. And, and Okay, and if, if not, um, I can certainly I can certainly follow up. Another question then, Dana, uh, if one retires and then goes back to work at considerably less income, say less than they earned at 65, is it ever reasonable to lessen IRA and other distributions but continue to take them from a tax and other standpoint if you think you have enough saved to sustain? So I think it's really just a question of, of does it make sense even though you're working uh, and have income to to maybe draw from an IRA for tax reasons. All right, let me think about that again. So you're retired early. You have a good financial plan. No, I'm well, reading a retired, different question. No, that's, I'm sorry. Yeah, they, uh, if one has retired and then goes back to work at considerably less than they were making before. Okay. It, is it ever reasonable to reduce or to lessen IRA and other distributions, but continue to take them from a tax standpoint um, yes. if you've got other assets. Okay. that's okay. Yes. So I get the question. So it's really like you've retired, but you went back to work, so you still have some earned income, but still we would be looking at your tax rates over your entire retirement years. And your tax rate may still be pretty low right now, and then if you don't take any IRA distributions and they begin at age 73 or 75, those distributions could be pretty large and put you in a much higher tax rate then. So there are times where it, it makes sense to take IRA distributions, even though you don't need the money for consumption. And it mm -hmm. could be and if you're going to take that distribution, then why not just make it a Roth IRA conversion at that point? So you don't need it. You take it out of the IRA. You pay the tax. You put it in your Roth IRA. It now grows tax free for you. So there's many cases where that makes sense. Okay. Um, back to I have up on the screen. You can see this how your Social Security benefits are calculated. Um, yep. Is that showing up, Nancy? Yeah. It is. Yep. So, I see that. If you, you know, are, are retiring at age 62, you begin benefits before what's called your full retirement age, you are going to receive a reduced amount and you are going to be subject to the earnings limit. Now, in that person's question, it was a non-working spouse or they hadn't worked much, so the earnings limit wouldn't apply. Once you're full retirement age, um, then you would get your full amount. I don't have the spousal benefits on this example. I was thinking I did. But um, this person, once their spouse retired, they would be eligible for half of what the spouse would get at their full retirement age. That's how spousal benefits work. So I was hoping that slide would help, but maybe not as much as I thought. It's okay. Uh, another question, uh, this one is on Roth conversions. How do you figure the break even on a Roth conversion? What's the formula? Well, I don't know any formula um, other than we actually project it all out. And so, you know, we project out what would the assets be without the Roth conversion, what will it be with the Roth conversion, and when does the scenario with the Roth conversion exceed the scenario without the Roth conversion. I've seen people try to use formulas that use the marginal tax rate. It doesn't work because it doesn't take into account the all the other tax formulas, like the things that modified adjusted gross income impact. So it doesn't take account if you do a Roth conversion, you might pay more Medicare Part B and D premiums. It doesn't take account that if you do a Roth conversion, it could make more of your Social Security taxable, but less of it taxable later. So 
the simple marginal tax rate formulas just simply don't factor in all of those things. I don't know any way to do it other than to project out both scenarios using the full tax code and compare them and see when one scenario might exceed the other scenario. There is a paper on it. Um, it's a very technical paper. Oh, I can't remember the person's name, but but we may be able to add that to the comments when we post this to YouTube. So I'm going to make a note really quick, and it may have um, it may have some kind of a formula in it. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm just writing it down. Go ahead, Nancy. Okay. So what what percent of a portfolio should ideally be in Roth? I don't have a target on that. Um, I think of it again as like, you know, as you're accumulating money, you want, if possible, to get this tax diversity. So it's really more around when we talked about funding accounts tax efficiently, like if you were always in the highest tax rate, it might make sense to have almost none of your portfolio in a Roth because you would be maxing out deductible contributions uh, throughout the years. If you were, you know, in a middle tax rate, it might make sense to have like half Roth contributions, half traditional deductible contributions. So we don't really have a target because it's it's dependent on your income each year. Um, I do see that when people reach retirement, if they have a good balance, so I'm just going to call it a third, a third, a third a third in traditional IRA 401ks, a third in just after-tax brokerage accounts, and a third in Roth IRAs. They have a tremendous amount of flexibility, and we're usually able to keep their tax rate quite low, but I don't always know if that was the most tax-efficient way that they got there. It's just that's what they have, you know, at the time that we meet them, and it, and it works really well. So if I had to throw out a target, I'd throw out a third, a third, a third. Uh, this is a, a fairly involved question, Dana. So can one extend the golden window of Roth conversions by using QCDs at 73 to 76 and do conversions after that? If I convert now, I'd pay 40% tax, which seems silly and will likely remain in the high bracket for uh, years shortly after retirement since my wife will still be working and I have deferred compensation to keep my income high until mid-70s. Not a bad problem and not complaining, uh, but still not ideal for Roth conversion. I, I'm I'm thinking of the question is, is sort of is it is there a point where it's too late to, you know, maybe well, to, to do conversions or is there still that window? This is really interesting. I actually have never thought of this, so I really appreciate this comment because um, what this person is asking is basically so you can do a qualified charitable distribution up to a hundred thousand dollars. So let's say you know, you're age 73, you have your first required distribution, and let's just say it was 23,000 that you were required to take. Or well, let's say it's a big IRA and you have to take $60,000 out. Well, you could donate that entire 60,000 to charitable contribution, and none of it's reported on your adjusted gross income. So from a tax standpoint, it's as if your required minimum distributions didn't begin yet. And so then once you have fulfilled your required minimum distribution amount, you could then convert additional money to a Roth IRA. And so I would say, yeah, that could be a very viable strategy if you were willing and want to contribute that much to charity. Um, and I really appreciate that comment because it's something I've never thought of and I think it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, what is your take on the bank crisis? Should we minimize the amount of cash in bank accounts? What about brokerage accounts? Are those safe? Well, I sent a video out to all our clients, um, you know, the weekend that Silicon Valley Bank went under. I don't know that I have a take on the overall banking crisis, um, but I will say, you know, there's a there's a different set of rules that apply to brokerage accounts. And so we custody at Schwab as a firm and have gotten lots of questions about that. And so there's Schwab Bank, and so when you have cash in a brokerage account, right, it's swept into the bank side, and then there's the actual investments that you have in a brokerage account, whether that be Vanguard or Fidelity or, or whoever it might be. Your investments are not assets of the brokerage firm, So, and, and, and in Schwab's case, your investments are not assets of Schwab Bank. 
And so when we look across all of uh, the client accounts, almost none of them have over $250,000 in mm -hmm. actual Schwab Bank because they're invested assets and those are not subject to the bank. Your invested assets are not creditor, you're not subject to the creditors of the brokerage firm. So those are generally have a great deal of protection. There's a special rule called the SIPC that you can go Google and look up and, and learn more about how your brokerage assets are protected. So in my general thoughts, your assets are just fine at brokerage accounts. Now, you know, every it's been over a decade now since we got a lot of questions about FDIC insurance. This came up all the time in 2008. Of course it did. You know, there was big bank failures in the news. And so it does bring it to top of mind. Now in a brokerage account, you can buy CDs from different banks. So you could have, you know, a couple million dollars in one brokerage account but have a $200,000 CD from this bank and a you know a $50,000 CD from that bank and another $250,000 from this bank. And so you would still be well within those FDIC limits as far as what you had at any individual bank and yet have it more easily manageable inside one brokerage account. And so I think there are many strategies that you can use to help make sure that your assets at any one institution in any one bank are not over that FDIC limit and, and that makes sense. Um, in terms of you know my overall take on the banking crisis, you know, when you look at, at Silicon Valley Bank, it is what's called a mismatch in asset liability matching. Now we use asset liability matching in the way that we uh, deliver retirement cash flows from client accounts. So as an example, somebody needs to withdraw $50,000 next year. We will have a bond that we bought probably several years ago that's going to mature for $50,000. Well, we've matched the cash flow that's going to come out of the account with the asset that's going to be available at that point in time. Well, when interest rates go up, that asset, that bond that we bought a few years ago, probably had a pretty low yield. Interest rates went up, that bond went down. Now, if we can hold it to maturity till next year when the client's taking the withdrawal, it doesn't matter. So what that the bond's down in value? I don't need to sell it right now. That down will have no impact on me. Well, in a bank, they do the same thing, but on a much mass, more massive scale. They have their liquid assets available when people come and say, hey, I want my money back out of the bank. And then they have their hold to maturity portfolio. And their hold to maturity portfolio is designed to be held till those bonds mature. And so their hold to maturity portfolio on their balance sheet didn't have to be marked to market value. And so when interest rates went up, that hold the maturity portfolio on paper was down in value. And if they were able to hold it to maturity, that wouldn't be a problem. But what happened is suddenly there were lots and lots of withdrawals and the bank's liquid portfolio wasn't sufficient. And so once they have to start accessing that hold the maturity portfolio, those assets get marked to market value. And now the bank's undercapitalized and then social media contributed and then poof. And, and it turned into a, you know, a big mess very, very quickly. And so, you know, when we look at that, we go, well, this is exactly like why we use asset liability matching with our clients. Like we want to have a pretty good idea of how much is going to come out of which accounts so we can match that asset up in time with the withdrawal. But if we have a mismatch and the client suddenly said, well, I need twice as much money this year, you know, same thing would happen. We would have to sell some of those assets possibly at a loss because we weren't able to hold them to, to their designated time frame. And so that's essentially what happened, um, you know, and, and it seems like, you know, every 10 years or so we have one of these crises and I'm not even going to comment on all of that. We just, you know, have to get through it all and we have to have a strategy in place to make sure really that these things don't have a substantial impact on your lifestyle, that your retirement's not going to be ruined. I mean, that's really what you want. We, you know, we can debate all day long about why or what and, and how or why and all of that. But, you know, you want to make sure that when you're retired, that something like that is not going to derail your, your retirement. Yep. With inflation out of control, what percentage do you use in retirement planning spending and also for healthcare spending? 
So on healthcare spending, we've always used 5% and, um, and continue to do that. On regular spending, we typically use three and we continue to use three. Now, that's not to say like if you look at a decade, we had clients who didn't take any inflation raises for 10 years. And so we had essentially like this extra available. And so now suddenly we had really big inflation year and we would say, hey, you know, do you need to increase your monthly withdrawal and by an extra 500 or an extra thousand dollars a month? And many people said yes, but many more said no. They said, you know, what you're sending is, is enough. And so it's really, a, it's dependent on your stage in life. Um, we still think over a 30 year time horizon that 3% is reasonable. And that's gonna include time periods where, like any average, where it's above the average, and it's gonna include time periods where it's below the average. And additional research shows that retirees do not need their income to keep pace dollar for dollar with inflation. There was a whole nother research report that just came out on that in the last um, few weeks, possibly in the last few weeks, I remember seeing it. And so, you know, think about if you have a paid off mortgage in retirement versus if you're a renter. If you're a renter, inflation had a much bigger impact on you this year than if you had a fixed mortgage. And so they're just, it doesn't impact all demographics equally. If you're a retiree living on 50,000 a year, inflation has a much bigger impact on you. Increases in the price of energy and gas and food, you know, had a big impact you. If you're a, a, a retiree living off 150,000 a year, didn't have as much impact. So it's, it's back to, depends on your demographic and how we account for it. Uh, even with a plan, taxes are complicated. Can you recommend a CPA we might want to pressure test our tax strategies? <laughs> um, it really depends on, on where you live. And so, no, um, you know, we do refer people out to CPAs, but I find that many CPAs are more historians. And so they're looking at what happened last year. I have found very few that are good at projecting forward and almost none that are projecting forward more than a year. So I have seen some that will, you know, do tax strategies this year to the last year, but when it comes to retirement, when you get into corporate tax, you get some very advanced CPAs and tax strategies. But when you're talking about personal tax for retirement, you know, all the time, I, I, I people that don't understand the value of the Roth IRAs and they don't understand the tax torpedo that we talked about, and they they don't project that out over a 10 or 20 year time horizon for their clients. So it's it's a challenge. Uh, I have the goal of converting all of my taxable retirement accounts, like IRAs, to Roth. In a previous webinar, you seemed to scoff at a person who had just converted his entire retirement portfolio at the highest rate. You're not a scoffer. Um, at one point, I converted 10% of an IRA only to have the happy problem of having to go, of having the account go up by 10%. At that rate, I would never be able to convert all the IRA to Roth. Is it a good idea to just convert all IRAs and pay the astronomical taxes? It's hard to say, um, you know, hopefully I, I don't usually yeah. scoff at people, <laughs> I don't. but you know, I, in most cases, I don't think it makes sense to convert all of an IRA to a Roth. You know, when we look forward, you would have a 0% tax rate for, you know, and I don't know your tax situation, but a lot of ones I've looked at, you know, maybe somebody has guaranteed pension income and there could be a whole different reason to convert all of an IRA to a Roth that I don't know about without doing that projection. In, in most of the cases that I see, if people are converting all of the IRA to the Roth, they end up in a 0% tax rate, sometimes even with negative, negative taxable income later in mm -hmm. retirement. And, you know, we think like it didn't actually save them money over those the course of their retirement years. And so that's why we sometimes go, well, I think it's great if it saves you money. Like if we ran that projection out and, and paying all the taxes up front and including the growth rate on, on the assets, if that saved you money and was a viable strategy, then do it. But I don't know without running the numbers. And I just so far, I haven't seen very many cases where doing that actually 
resulted in a better potential outcome. And so that's that's why I might be, you know, a little hesitant or, or think, I don't know. I just, I haven't seen that work out. Sometimes people hear that it's 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 a good thing to do and, and there are those out there who say you should roth everything. Um, it's but not a bad thing. Too, it's why it's, it's just you may finance. pay a little bit more tax than you would have otherwise, right? So, but you know, if your rate of return on the Roth is high enough, you're right. But if it earned 10% one year, that's one thing. Is it going to earn 10% every year, right? If I knew I could earn 10% um, average return on my Roth and I felt really, really confident in that, I'd probably be a lot more amenable to converting most of that IRA to a Roth. And so a lot of it depends on the investments and you know what your expectations are and whether that plays out. We're pretty conservative in our rate of return assumptions too. And so that can impact things. For me, um, if a strategy only works if the rate of return is X or higher, then I, you know, it has to work even if the Roth doesn't have a higher return. And if the conversions work, even if the Roth doesn't have a higher return, then great. Let's, you know, put all the, the assets with the potential for the highest returns in the Roth and hopefully it looks even better than what we projected. Uh, Social Security question. So, or actually, I'm sorry, estimated taxes question. I collect Social Security and do not have taxes taken out planning on doing Roth conversion in June, would I pay an estimated uh, qu a quarterly tax in September? Or because I know I'm doing this in 2023, should I pay quarterly tax in March and June? Um, I don't know without, you know, a tax projection, but there's a, a form that will run the taxes out quarterly and actually attribute the tax to the quarter in which the income occurred. And so I don't know the answer to that. You know, it's possible if you wait until September that you could be at risk of an underpayment penalty. I just don't know for sure. I know this doesn't apply to this webinar. However, does Dana ever discuss strategies for starting Social Security for married couples with a 10 year age difference? Um, I've never done a webinar on it, but um, I, I have lots of articles on it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I don't know off the you top of my it. head. You know, it really depends on who the highest wage earner is. I can I can follow back up uh, with that one. When retiring in your uh, retiring early in your fifties, how would one prioritize doing Roth conversions for future tax benefits versus keeping income low to take advantage of the healthcare tax credit, healthcare subsidy credit? When we look at that, usually the healthcare tax credit value trumps the value of the Roth conversion. So again, I don't know without doing it on a case by case basis, but I have run several projections where I said, let's assume we do Roth conversions and now we don't get the healthcare tax credit. Now let's assume no Roth conversions and we do get the healthcare tax credit and the healthcare tax credit usually results in a better numerical outcome over time. And so when we encounter those situations, um, we run the numbers, but so far those numbers have always said, I would forego the Roth conversion and, and do the healthcare tax credit. The nice thing is now once 65 hit and RMDs don't begin till 73 or 75, you would still, and if you delayed social security between 65 and 70, you would still have a good window of time where you could potentially do Roth conversions after that healthcare tax credit was no longer applicable. If there's an age difference between the two of you, um, and it's a couple, that can impact things too. Does your tax planning software automatically determine healthcare tax credit eligibility, or do you have to know in advance before doing your taxes? Um, well, we we do a projection model that that pretty much, you know, tells us. And, and so we know, like, we'll have it flagged, like, hey, you know, need to keep this client under this amount of AGI. And so then we project out what we think it's going to be to make sure that they're going to qualify. Um, not clear on long-term capital gains. What's the different, what is the different brackets, 0, 15, 20, based on total AI, uh, AGI? Um, no, it's based on taxable income. And so if we go back to, um, let's see, one of these slides, 
like here, you know, if we look at this client's taxable income, let's see, how am I going to do this? In this case, you know, their taxable total, like qualified income that qualified for my red dot is stuck for some reason. It won't move. Let's see if I can get it to move. There we go. So 2021, let's just look. We had $255,000 of total income, right? And so there's uh, this range where they say, all right, here's how much of that income fell into the 23,000, into the 0% tax rate, the 15% or the 20% tax rate. So if I go back to this slide that has the tax rates on it, it's way back there. This is taxable income, ordinary taxable income. So if I had ordinary taxable income of $50,000, right? I could have another $38,250 of long-term capital gains and dividends that would still be taxed at zero. But let's say I have, you know, ordinary taxable income of $50,000 and $150,000 of capital gains. Well, the first $38,250 of capital gains will be taxed at zero, and then the rest will fall up into this 15% tax rate. But let's say I have $100,000 of ordinary income. Well, I've exceeded this threshold. So that ordinary income pushes the other capital gains income up into these higher tiers. So now I have $100,000 of ordinary income. None of my long-term capital gains will be taxed at zero. They will all now fall into this 15 or 20% or tax rate. So it's like the capital gains tax rates get stacked on top of this taxable ordinary income. I'm sure that's clear as mud. <laughs> no, it's fine. I was, look, I was just trying to look up a, an answer to something um, else. And it was, how do you document if you do a QCD? Um, so usually you get something from your charity. You know, I mean, you don't, yeah. there's nothing you actually file with your tax return. It's almost like the honor system, right? Hey, you know, I donated this much no. to, to charity, but usually you get something back from the charity thanking you for that donation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, regarding the 1099 mistake slide, people who do backdoor Roth IRA contributions every year and have no IRAs, the basis on their yearly form 8606 is always zero, correct? Or am I missing something? Uh, no, I think it would be zero. Yeah. But you also don't have any non-deductible IRA basis to record because you moved it all right to the Roth IRA. So in your case, that pro rata calculation isn't even going to apply. If I'm maxing out on my Roth and have a 457B plan that now offers Roth options, can I still choose to participate in the Roth options in the 457B? Um, yeah. So if your income's low enough to contribute to a Roth IRA and you can also contribute to your Roth 403B at work, yes. So um, just like if you max out a, a traditional IRA, and your, your income is low enough to make a deductible IRA contribution, you can also contribute to a 401k at work. So those limits are, you know, they're not combined. So you can max out a 401k and an IRA. You can max out a Roth IRA and a Roth 401k. Just your income limitations apply to the IRA portions of each of those. No. Um, how much does a widow's tax affect one's planning we're thinking ahead for IRA conversions or removals. Um, by a widow's tax, I think what you might be referring single. to yeah. is just the difference between the single and the married tax rates. And so if we go back, maybe I should just stay on these tax rate slides. It's a lot of clicking. Okay. Um, if we go back to these tax rates, the ordinary income tax rates, right? And you think about, let's say, you know, you're a married couple and your income's falling in this 89,000 to 190,000, you're at the 22% top marginal rate, 
and one spouse passes, well, what happens? Well, now, you know, that same amount of income that was taxed at 22%, you know, some of it might be taxed at 24. Or, you know, let's say you were closer to this 190,000. Some of that income now as a single is going to be taxed at the 32% tax rate. And so what happens when the first spouse passes is you lose the lower social security amount and then these higher tax rates apply and you have oftentimes required minimum distributions because at that point you're you know you're often in your late 70s. And so how does that factor I think the question was into the Roth conversion? Well, a lot of times we do recommend Roth IRA conversions because that Roth asset can be really beneficial if one spouse is longer lived. And so at that point these higher tax rates might apply to them as a single person and now they have that Roth IRA that they could draw from and in that those withdrawals would be tax free and so that that is how we look at that we do factor that into the analysis in general Dana how do you feel about long-term care insurance my husband and I are 60 and not retired yet wondering if we should be adding long-term care insurance well, it's very expensive, and how do I feel about it? I wish we all could afford it. <laughs> That's how I, you know. Um, and yet, I, we have a, a planner Slack channel where we all ask each other questions, and this topic just came up this week. I can't remember if it was somebody you were looking yeah, at, Nancy. Yeah. Uh, Kathy. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And, you know, they got this quote back, and, and one of our planners, Kathy, was like, guys, does this seem right? Like it was twice as much as the quotes we ran two years ago. And mm -hmm. so it was, I think it was going to be close to 10,000 a year to insure this couple for three years of long-term care. Like it's, it has gotten very expensive. Um, there are some, what are called asset care type policies where you put a lump sum of money in, there's a life insurance benefit tied to it. And then if you need long-term care, it will turn on an income stream. Um, and so some of those can be worth looking at, but it really, you know, as a matter of projecting out, many people will have enough assets. They just don't realize they will have enough assets. So, you know, it might be that they're in 20 years, their property could be worth, you know, quite a bit. And at the point that you need to long a substantial long-term care, you're usually selling the house. Um, and so it's it's a real challenge. I mean, the honest answer is covering long-term care. It's so unknown. About 15% of the population by the stats will incur a very substantial long-term care event that will cost over 250000 and the other 85% won't. And so it's really how do we plan if we fall into that 15%? And if you can afford the insurance, that can be a great way to cover it or just set aside part of your income. Or you can plan on self-insuring uh, if you have an asset like a, a, a home that will be paid off and, and you know at some point you would sell that and that would need to be used to fund your care. I have been accumulating money in an HSA. When does it make sense to start using the money in that account? Is it, and the second part of that, is it beneficial for an inheritance? We just talked about all of this in one of our planner <laughs> meetings too. And so no, HSAs are one of the worst assets to inherit. So let me start with the second half of your question. And so you typically want to spend your HSA and not leave that asset on to heirs. Your Roth IRA, great asset to leave on to heirs. HSAs, not so inheritance friendly. And so there's a few ways to use it. One, um, in those opportunities years, let's say you're doing Roth IRA conversions, you might be using your HSA to pay for your insurance premiums pre-65 or for your Part B premiums post-65. I believe you cannot pay your supplemental insurance premiums with them. Um, two, you could wait and when your required minimum distributions start, um, you know, if you had care needs above and beyond those other income, you're probably in a higher tax rate then. And so you could have a, a plan to take the, the money out over that 10 year period, um, maybe between 75 and 85. But I think there, you know, there's definitely different strategies that you want to look at. And during those opportunity years, um, if you're trying to do Roth conversions, 
or if you have years where you could get capital gains taxed at zero, but you need to pay for some of your health care, that HSA could be a great source of tax-free income to use during those opportunity years. And, and so we definitely think it's something you build up until about your retirement years, and then you don't want to leave it all the way until your 80s or 90s. Yep. Uh, what are some of the examples when it comes to SIPC insurance um, of $500,000 comes into play to help when a brokerage is in trouble? If investors have a taxable amount of a million dollars at Schwab, how worried should they be in this case? My understanding is that it's still no worries because the brokerage account can be moved to a different brokerage. Yeah, so that SIPC insurance, it's not, so your assets, let's say you have a million dollars at Schwab or Fidelity or, you know, wherever, and it's all invested in mutual funds and stocks. Well, you have no need for that SIPC insurance. That would only cover what it's called is, I think the term, if you go to the website and read it, is like missing securities, like, and you think, what? What does that mean? Well, Let's say we were in the middle of, you know, journaling. Uh, there was a, a security that was moving from one custodian to another. And that's a, a transfer called an ACAT or, or a wire. Let's say, you know, funds are being wired. And when a fund gets wired, it hits the, the brokerage firm's general account and then it gets for further credit to your account. So a security comes in or a wire comes in and it hasn't hit your individual account yet, and the brokerage firm files bankruptcy while it's in that place. Well, that would be the definition of a missing security, right? The bankruptcy gets filed before that security that just transferred in got furtherly credited to your account. So the SIPC insurance is covering those situations. If you have a million dollars in a taxable account that's all invested, it might be in treasury bills and mutual funds and stocks and bonds, it's, you know, those assets are not assets of the, the brokerage firm. And so the SIPC insurance wouldn't ever need to cover those anyway. Um, got a few more here. Um, I have a large amount in the Franklin Income Fund resulting in about 43000 a year, with most of it taxed at the higher ordinary income rate. Should I sell it and buy an ETF? I need about 10000 a month. Uh, I have a 24% rate, I'm assuming the 24% tax bracket. Um, what should I do with two inherited IRAs that I earn about 18000 on? Should I reduce the size of each IRA? Uh, I'm unable to convert my, I'm unable to convert to my Roth IRA. Yeah, you can't inher convert inherited IRAs, but the first question would really depend on the, the cost basis of that Franklin fund. So, you know, sometimes there's funds that have paid out a lot of their gains and dividends along the way. And so you may be able to sell the entire fund and have a very low tax consequence. Or you might be able to sell it and that capital gain that you incurred would fall in one of those lower tax rates, zero or 15%. Um, or it could be a fund, you could have a million dollars in that Franklin fund and your cost basis on it was 500,000. And if you sell it all, you're going to have a $500,000 capital gain. And so I don't know. <laughs> and so that would require, you know, some some projections of several different ways of doing it to see if you know maybe you could sell it over several years and then that capital gains could be taxed at a lower rate but there's no way to answer that question um, off the cuff unfortunately yeah. given that many agency bonds and many brokerage CDs are callable is there a reason to buy secondary agencies or CDs with lower coupons and realize a large portion or the total return as a capital gain when the bond matures? Um, yes, so that's a simple answer. Yes, that can, can often be a good strategy. Just a, a few more here, Dana. Um, in, in your example of taking unneeded IRA distributions and just then doing a Roth IRA conversion, are you paying the taxes out of the IRA funds or other? Typically other. And so um, in most cases we see when you're doing the Roth IRA conversions, you want to have enough assets outside the IRA to cover the tax. 
so again, I say typically, there's always exceptions. <laughs> I'm not scoffing at anyone. No. no. And so, um, you know, typically there, there's a, that's the problem with this. There's always exceptions. And so, you know, there there are cases where you would convert from an IRA to a Roth and pay the taxes out of the IRA, but now you have to pay taxes on the amount that went to taxes. And so sometimes when we run those numbers out, it 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 doesn't work as well. It doesn't add as much value as if you had money outside the IRA to pay the tax. Yep. How should I determine whether to fill the 12% tax bracket with a Roth conversion? Well, if we were to look out at what your tax rate might be later, let's say when your required minimum distribution start, it might be 22%. And we would say, all right, if once your required distribution start, you're definitely gonna be in the 22% tax rate. And instead, if we were able to convert some each year right now at 12%, then we've effectively, you know, used tax arbitrage. We've saved you 10% in total taxes on the amount of that conversion, plus the taxes now that it's in the Roth on any future gains that it has. And so that's what we do. We look at your tax rate now. We look at what your tax rate would be if you don't do the conversion in the future. And, and typically, if there's a, a difference, we would say, yeah, you want to fill up that 12% tax rate now. I don't quite understand how depreciation recapture works for rental properties when you sell them. Can you walk through an example? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, rental property taxation is not my strong suit, I'll say that, but um, in general, right, each year you claim depreciation on your when you have a rental property. And so because of the depreciation, there's many times where you can own a property that could be cash flow positive, but we call it tax negative. So it's creating a loss on your tax return because of that depreciation. That depreciation isn't a cash transaction, right? It's the IRS saying you own this asset and you're going to have to do upkeep and repairs on it. And so to account for that, we're going to allow you to depreciate this asset. We're going to allow you to take a tax loss. And it's a formula. The IRS will say, here's how much based on the value of the property that you can take each year. Well, that accumulates. So let's just say a round number. You have $3,000 a year of you know depreciation accumulation. And you've owned the property for 10 years. Well, now when you sell that property, and assuming there is a gain on the property, you're going to have to take that, that $30,000 of depreciation that's accumulated, and it's going to be taxable at the depreciation recapture rate on your tax return. So that's the, a very simple explanation. There's probably a more detailed and complex way of explaining it that is not going to be right there on the tip of my tongue. Um. Have you had many examples uh, of Roth conversions making sense paying 35, uh, paying the 35 to 37% bracket? Uh, I presume this may work if you know you will remain in the highest tax bracket, but other than this situation? Um, well, yeah, for clients that know like they're never going to spend all their wealth and they really want that Roth to pass to future generations, then yes, I've still seen that that makes sense. But those are, are usually the cases, you know, they would be prepaying the tax for their heirs is essentially what they're doing. Okay. Um, I think this is maybe a good one to end on. Uh, Dana, you're very impressive. Great job. <laughs> thank you for your expertise. Well, thank Thanks you. God. I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> And um, I appreciate all you troopers. You wouldn't believe how many people stay all the way through this Q&A. It always amazes us. And, um, you know, we appreciate all the questions. We appreciate, you know, all of you who contribute to us. You really do. Your que questions contribute back to us. So uh, thank you, everybody. And Nancy, thank you. I always appreciate my, your help. My pleasure, as always. Oh. All right. Good night, everybody.